joining. Um, being recorded. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Ben Sautner. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer at Comcast. And uh, the last six years, I've been part of the engineering team at Xfinity, uh, where we worked on uh, the Xfinity Home Security app, which is the, uh, the app you use to control your home and your home security system and do things like turn on lights and close your door locks and open your garage door and manage your security cameras. Um, we also work on the XFi app, uh, which is used to manage your, your home network and your Wi-Fi. Uh, so today I want to share what we've learned about building apps at Comcast scale and some of the things we've learned along the way. So, um, so for those of you with the XFi app on your phone today, or even if you're just a Comcast customer um, and you want to go to the Google Play Store and install it, um, there's also the Xfinity Home app if you use our home security product. Um, you may notice that we just recently renamed it to Xfinity. Um, we now refer to it as the Xfinity app. Um, so uh, we've gone through this rebranding and we're really excited about it. Um, so besides controlling your home Wi-Fi and being able to do things like you might have seen commercials around this, around pausing your, uh, your home Wi-Fi during dinner or you know, at bedtime, um, and you can uh, now do, uh, use the app to do many of the things that you could do in the Xfinity home app, like view your home security cameras, uh, you manage your Comcast account, view recorded uh, security video footage, um, as well as do a lot of new things like um, use our new um, uh, built-in network security um, and test your internet speed. Um, you can also do things like uh, uh, purchase Wi-Fi extender pods or upgrade your, your, your modem and use the app to onboard those new devices when they come in the mail and, um, and pair them to your network and activate them. Um, so uh, what I really want to talk about today is a lot of what goes into making uh, this app of this size and how we're able to work productively at a very large company with hundreds of developers with a common goal of shipping this product to our customers. So I'm going to compare um, building this app, uh, which has been in production for many years. It's got a huge code base and millions of weekly users. Um, but when I talk about scale, um, what I'm talking more about is scaling horizontally rather than vertically. So to explain that, when I say horizontally, I mean talking about all the diverse number of features that go into this app and everything that the app can do. Um, so like from home automation and protecting your Wi-Fi network. So there are a lot of huge apps out there like Twitter or Instagram that have a, a huge user base and have to scale vertically uh, to be extremely performant uh, to, while doing um, some very specific features for their users. Um, Xfinity needs to scale uh, you know, both vertically to be highly performant with, with a million, millions of users, but also it needs to scale horizontally by being able to add more and more functionality and more features to this app. Um, so the, this, uh, I lost my place here. Um, so at this size, if you're just working in one code base, if it was just one big Xfinity app, uh, GitHub repo that we were all working in at the same time, um, the app can take something like 30 minutes to do a full build on, it can take 20 minutes to run all your unit tests. It can take almost like two hours to run UX automation testing and instrumentation. So this can be brutal for a developer who wants to make changes to a core code base of the app or to make a web service change without the risk of breaking something. So, so many moving parts. We also have 10 or so build variants to support partners. So um, other companies that may be using our technology with their branding. Um, and so that alone adds hours and hours to, to, to take a, you just want to get a, a, some code merged into the main Xfinity apps co uh, code base. Um, just getting that pull request from, you know, from, you know into, into, the, uh, into our core code base can be uh, very, very difficult and brutal for some developers. So um, we've overcome a lot of these problems. That's what I'm here to share with you today. What approaches we've taken to make uh, developers really productive and ship products really efficiently and to build that app that uh, a code base that won't collapse under its own weight as, as we grow. So, you know, this talk is all about communication between each stage of development. So we use the development tools, a lot of the tools we talked about today at the conference, um, as a means to communicate each step of the development process uh, to get new features integrated into the, um, the main Xfinity app. We want to make sure that developers are happy and they're productive and they're coding away and not trying to figure out um, how a new platform uh, web service works or how an SDK they're not familiar with works. Um, so each of these dots on the screen um, show like each step of the development process that I wanna focus on today 
um, and how we how we address each one of these. So um, I want to take you down kind of our stack in the wrong place and talk about how we use open API standards to build our web services um, that can be consumed by the, and what, uh, something I'm gonna talk about is open API code generator to produce like perfect representations of our backend services um, and perfect retrofit interfaces and models. Um, I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, we talk about how we use GitHub templates for spinning up new feature uh, projects. So when a new team starts to uh, add some new, new exciting functionality to our app, how we uh, isolate those teams using, and how we use GitHub templates to make sure they're doing all the right things and building, building features that are gonna work in the Xfinity app. Um, how we build Android libraries um, and SDKs uh, instead of trying to work directly in the main code base. So uh, I'm really excited to talk about that. We do some really awesome things around building Android libraries and how we integrate those into the, into the app itself. Um, we also built out a structure for developers to work in uh, what we call reference apps. So instead of trying to work off this uh, giant monolithic uh, Xfinity app code base, um, which may, again, you know, might take five minutes just to, just to hit the play button in Android Studio and get it onto your, your emulator, your device, and, and run it. Um, reference apps are really small. They only contain the features that you're working on, and you're able to work extremely productive in, in that environment. Um, and then the, uh, the very last step is I want to talk briefly about how we use dependency injection and Dagger to um, inject um, uh, our new libraries into the main Xfinity app that I've been talking about. Um, so before we talk about Android development, we kind of need to talk about the back end service that drives our app. Now, we, we do have a, a real asynchronous nature to our app. We have this MQTT broker that we use for this pub sub work uh, for doing things like if you have a, a, a light bulb in your house that, that's on or off, and we want to send a message to the app saying that light just turned off, and the app's going to switch it with the, the off icon. Um, and uh, that's all asynchronous and happening in the background, but I, hopefully you've all caught Sweetie's talk before mine where she went into a real deep dive about MQTT, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I am gonna talk about our web services um, and how we build and deploy those and that, that, drive, that drive all the, uh, the data that the app uses. So you know, Comcast, we have this enormous infrastructure and we have experimented in the past with building like monolithic web services, so there'd be like one one big web service that, um, the, that, that did everything for the app. It was the one API to rule them all. And um, you know, from that, that experience, I recommend against that approach and some of the things we learned while trying to do that. Um, I know many of you might be using things like GraphQL or, or Hypermedia and Hatios to drive your apps. And, and again, we've experimented with that and found that it's really not an ideal uh, uh, specification for web services that uh, for driving mobile apps. They're great for maybe some back-end back -end purposes, but, um, but multi-featured mobile apps that are, need to consume data that might be com coming from completely different formats or completely different services, um, we find that building microservice-based uh, uh, open uh, API, uh, using open API specifications, uh, make it so you can build and deploy web services and make ch changes quickly without needing some massive cross-team communications that you're about to make a change to some beast of an API or web service or, um, or some change to the app that might cause side effects. Um, so by siloing these web services in um, uh, as microservices, uh, we're able to move forward very quickly with new work. Um, so we build uh, services following what I said, open API specifications. And there's a real important reason for that. Um, these are generally REST-ish web services that are just doing what you'd expect. They're putting JSON back and forth between the app and the service and doing you know, our puts and our gets and our posts. Um, but what's important here is, is a, every time a new version of an API is shipped uh, from the API team, they also ship an API spec, an API doc. And this is just a YAML file, but it defines all the models and endpoints we use when we're talking to, to, the, to the API. And we use a tool, this is open source, you can go download it and you can check it out. Um, and it's called an open API code generator. Um, and this will ingest the API spec and, um, and generate client code uh, that is a, a perfect representation of the web service. Um, so a few things happen here. First, there is we, uh, the open API generator has a verify uh, option. So we can tie the open API generator verify 
into the web service build process and make sure that whenever we ship a new version of a microservice, the verify is running against their spec and the build can break because of that. If, there, if, there, if there's a bug or there's a problem or something's not quite right for the mobile, mobile clients that um, we're getting from a, uh, a, uh, uh, the verify process, the build breaks and we have to go back and say, hey, just go fix that. So that's, that's the first step in communicating to the web service developers that, we, uh, that they need to be able to give us a, um, a spec that's perfect for the client. Um, so platform developers uh, ship the spec in the form of that YAML file and we verify that and we build, and we build that um, without needing, so with the clients not really needing to know and have a lot of domain knowledge about how that backend service works, um, what they're getting is uh, Java and soon Kotlin um, client code, just as the things that Android developers uh, recognize immediately as retrofit interfaces. I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. So there's a, uh, some of the benefits of doing this. Um, the story I like to tell about um, back in the day, maybe five years ago at Xfinity Home, um, we had a, a field that our app, the Xfinity Home app, uh, referenced for, again, it was a light, light on or off uh, flag. So the, the field's name in the JSON was uh, on equals false or on equals true. And, um, you know, that somebody on the, on, the web, on the web service team decided, hey, that, that's a little archaic or that's not very descriptive. So they, they renamed um, the field to is on equals false or is on equals true. And um, because at the time we were writing our retrofit, our retrofit um, uh, interfaces by hand and our, and our object models just based on kind of interpreting the JSON that we're getting from the services. And a lot of you may have done this where you, you, you make a test call, you get some JSON, you maybe use a, a, a JSON to POJO or JSON to Kotlin data class uh, a tool, and um, you're kind of maintaining that, that uh, API client from uh, manually. And because of that was the case, um, we didn't notice in the client team, and instead of getting uh, an, an on is true or on is false, we got on was null because the field was changed. Um, and, and that caused a, um, a, a runtime crash. So we, we caught it pretty early because we do a lot of regression, but um, it, using this paradigm, you, uh, uh, by giving the client teams new builds of a client library, the representations of your uh, web service, as soon as we bump the version of the library that we're using, we get a, um, a compile time error because the, the, we were referencing in our code an object that had a field called on that was gone. And uh, so we import the new version of the library, uh, we, we, we compile our code, we get a runtime error. So the real magic here is that we pushed the, the, the identifying changes and bugs to web services from runtime and potentially at runtime in, your, in the hand of one of your customers to compile time at the, uh, on the developer's workstation. It's real easy to find and fix. So, you know, as I said on the first slide, this, is, this talks all about communication. And by the, the, the API spec, communicating back to the web, the web team what to develop, what the clients need. And then this is a way that the, the web service team can communicate to the client team that, hey, we made changes to our service you need to adapt to. Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't highlighting my little arrows. I was really, worked really hard on getting those, those yellow dots to line up. <laughs> so, um, so this is a real quick example of exactly what I've been talking about, about code gen. And you know, up in the right-hand corner of my slide, I, I have the, the, the code gen, a list of the code generators. It's just the top of it, actually. The Open API code generator uh, is, a, is a highly supported uh, open source project. That list goes on and on. You can, you can generate client code of uh, just about any language that's out there. So we are using the Java one. Java, we're generating Java client code and Rx Java. Um, uh, observables uh, with our with inside of our retrofit interfaces. Um, the, there's a Kotlin one. It's just still a little green. Um, it's an open source project, so everybody's encouraged to go in there and make it better. But I, I'm certain that once the um, the Kotlin generator does what we need it to do, it'll uh, uh, we'll be ready to use it. So um, again, this this is a uh, this. Uh, Oh, my square's off. Um, sorry about that. I wanted to highlight uh, the, the first part of this, the, the Java jar. 
Um, and uh, so you can just, just to read through this, you have a, um, uh, a command. It's just uh, running a jar file. It's, uh, it's, it's executing a jar file that's, that's calling generate, ingesting, uh, just reading this right from left because my, my boxes aren't working. Um, uh, you're ingesting an API doc that's, that's hosted on a web service. And this is again, that, that, that next step in the communication line where the client teams are telling the web service teams that these are all the things we want in our library. These are the package names we want to use retrofit and we want to use JSON as our serialization. We want to use a Java 8 date library. So if you kind of read that, an, a, 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 an, a, a web service developer who, um, a web service developer that uh, may be working in Go or maybe working as, you know, in a Spring Boot app um, would not even know maybe what Retrofit or Kotlin was. So this is how we tell them what we want in our client library. The, uh, the code snippet at the bottom is just an example of a Retrofit interface that got generated by this. So these are all the things that if you're doing this um, by hand, um, you, uh, you would be wasting your time. So if you have, if you have an, an open API um, uh, service, you can skip the entire uh, part of, of writing data classes and retrofit interfaces and just generate them all, 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 all automatically. And this can, this can result in thousands of, of lines of code saved that you don't have to worry about and the safety net of building a, um, a service uh, of catching service changes and not really even needing to understand the service by reading through the, the API documentation uh, because an, an Android developer is going to look at this retrofit interface and totally understand, uh, hey, here's an API I can call to get some devices that I need and here are all the headers it requires uh, and all the parameters it requires to get me the data that I need. That I need. There's my box. So the next step is um, we use code generation. Uh, we, after we've generated our, our libraries and we have a, um, a bunch of web services that are ready to go, um, we have the development, development team work in uh, their own projects, which are, we refer to as um, uh, reference apps. And uh, in that next step, uh, we give each new team that's spun up, that's being spun up to build a new feature, a, a GitHub template. So if you haven't used GitHub templates, it's really cool. It's not forking. It means that, that all of our most senior engineers work together to put together an empty Android library project in our GitHub. And this is all the patterns and best practices baked into it. It has sample unit tests. It has sample code structures. Uh, you, have, uh, you still haven't had to touch the Xfinity app code base. And our template project also has what we call the, a reference app, which is also uh, uh, from that template and everything you need to get going. So it has things like our login flow and all of our sample grade, Gradle dependencies and, and integrations into our linting and our, and our, and our test environments. Um, so on day one, when a, new, when a new team is starting to work on that feature, um, they, they, they create, use this template, create their new GitHub repo. It's already got the build, the, the CI CD and the build scripts for deploying their library out to our Nexus repository. And they can just get going on using those libraries that we know, and we know that we know they work and, um, and they have everything you need to just, to just get going. So at this point, the team is working with their implementation library. They're importing one or more client libraries and talking to a microservice that, and talking to the microservices. Uh, they're able to work quickly on their really small code base. Uh, for example, our camera crew uh, has a reference app that just shows some security cameras in it and, um, nothing, and nothing else. And they're able to be completely focused on that code and not worry about any other uh, tech debt or engineering, or engineering problems that may be in the Xfinity code base. Um, so by design, their work and their code, their feature specific code that's specific only to cameras is isolated in their library. And that really prevents uh, uh, code from leaking into other features and ending up kind of spaghettifying your app. Um, and that's, I mean, that's how spaghetti code happens is people start referencing code they shouldn't, they shouldn't be to because it kind of looks like what they need. Um, and so that's not possible here. Um, so there's also a way when developers uh, come back from conferences like this one, and they're all excited because they learned about some new tool or some new library or some new pattern. Um, we're not locked into some, into one tool set. Um, if there's some, we come back to Google IO and say, hey, we want to, we want to try this new, this new library. We can, we are free to experiment with that library um, in our 
in our sample, in our, in our libraries and in our reference apps. Um, and not having to go back to the developer and say, you can't work that way, you can't use that new tool because we're really locked in because it's, it's very deeply integrated. Another, another older thing is deeply integrated into our app. So something like we switched from Rx Java to coroutines, um, you know, we were able to write new features completely with, with, with Kotlin and coroutines because um, we weren't locked into Rx Java in, in, in that case. And I, in my opinion, that really allows us to attract new talented Android engineers who want to work with the cool new 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 technologies, and um, uh, and not going to uh, to uh, some huge company like Comcast and saying you know hey you have to work with these really old tool sets and these really old libraries because we're stuck with them because they're, they're, we started working with them five years ago. Uh, following this pattern allows you to um, to experiment and grow and then migrate to things if something really works. We can start looking at we can add that new thing that we really like to our template new libraries will be generated using that new to those new tools becomes part of our our, our day-to-day -day work and then also going back with some you know addressing treating treating the old code like um you know tech debt and and, and circling back and updating new libraries and, and and making sure our app stays as modern as possible so um the uh the last thing i want to touch on here from the that 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 communication framework is um, is how we use Rx Java. I'm sorry, how we use Dagger for a dependency injection framework. Um, and what you see here on the left is a sample of a um, of a library project that is providing a component builder um, to. And this is how we communicate requirements from a library to what the host app needs. To make it work, so on the left, uh, that we we heavily use these the binds instance annotation, um, and uh, which uh, as the annotation processor with Dagger runs, uh, it creates a builder that makes the the things that the the library need to work. Um, uh, when you when you get a new version of that library. Um, and, and, and update the version in the host app, the main Xfinity app, if, uh, if a dev team said, well, hey, we added a few requirements in order for us, for our, um, for our app to function, for our feature to function, uh, they, can, they can communicate that to the host app by adding these uh, bind instances annotations to their builder. And then if you see there, there are these little annotations inside the, um, methods that are, are like the, there's one called TTL that's a time to live that they, the, the, the developer needed a, uh, the host app to give it a time, a, time, a, a, a completely random uh, long value that you just needed to, to make, make something work. Um, but by, by, by adding these, um, uh, these little annotations, which um, are called qualifiers um, to your dagger and your dagger um, module for your builder, um, that that first can be used all throughout your app by reusing that annotation elsewhere in your dagger graph, but then also when the new when the, when a new uh, version of the their library is released, it um, uh, the implementer of that library immediately knows that because when they up the version, they get a compile time error and they um, they have to go in and see what to, what what new thing do I have to add to this library to make to make that work. Um, so I think that's really, really cool. So, you know, these are the lessons that we've learned over the years, um, many of which are uh, some of these, I have some of these uh, personal opinions about how to build an app, not only at, uh, that scales horizontally with, with more and more users and horizontally with many more diverse features, um, but also if you're building an app that has the potential to grow very large, that means that, it, that you as a developer are going to grow as, as a professional engineer. You're gonna need more and more talented engineers to join your organization to help you complete, continue to build that app. Um, and also your org will grow and have, and your, your app will grow and contain more and more moving parts. Um, so like over this time, new exciting tools and technology will become available to you. And you want your app to be able to migrate and adopt these new tools and avoid like a lock-in. So, your app is going to mature and need to have these features replaced with new versions, and you don't want uh, that to be—you don't want that to be totally time-consuming and require major surgery to your code base. 
Um, so the most, the biggest takeaways I'd like to leave you with, and these are just a few, you know, last lessons learned um, that I've learned over the years of, of building building big apps, um, is is avoid a monolithic app. Try to avoid the temptation to build one big app and see if you can separate your your functionality up into libraries. Multi-module projects are fine. I'm not a huge fan of multi-module projects, but um, but they 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 have their time and place. Um, avoid trying to build you know, the big web service that does everything and, and uh, uh, you know, target microservices and some services can stand in front of those services to consolidate their functionality, but, um, but still try to avoid making a, a one size fits all web service. Um, you really wanna make it okay for your developers to try new things in their library and also make it okay for your business leaders to try new things on your platform. So you might have some um, business, uh, a uh, person come to you and say, hey, we've got this third party SDK, we want to put it in your in, in our app. And a lot of developers, you know, our brains explode when they when we hear that because we don't want to adopt the third party SDK. Um, but by following this kind of pattern, you can isolate those SDKs, uh, those third party SDKs in those libraries and then really easily switch them out. Um, so when they change their mind, you know, it'll be real easy to 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 import a new a new different library that implements a new different third party SDK or take it out completely. And that really just that if you, um, uh, if you if you if you're making changes in your code base and you find that I've removed this one this one piece of functionality and you know 500 classes all have build errors now that I have to address, you know, you're kind of doing something wrong. Um, and uh, I think the last thing, and it's um, right right about hit five o'clock and have time for questions. Um, uh, I'm very passionate about organizing your code by feature, not by function. So. You may have, if you look at your code base, there's some, I'm sure there's some people out there, you know who you are, um, who are organizing your code in a way where you might have like a package in your, in your app uh, that's called fragments, and that's all your fragments are in there. Or you might have a package called models, and all your models are in there. Or, your, your, or view models, and all your view models are in there. Um, and you know, when you start to grow and add more and more fragments, that might make sense if you have like five or six fragments or one or two activities, and they can be in a package called activities. Um, when you grow and you end up with like 5,000 fragments or, you know, 50 activities, you kind of look at that and say, these are all in the same package, but they have nothing to do with each other, except that they're all fragments or they're all, they're all data classes or they're all whatever, you know, um, they all, they all are the same thing, but they all do, they all have different functionalities. Um, so don't organize your code by feature, uh, by, I'm sorry, by function, organize your code by feature. The package, the, the, the package path. Uh, leading up to your classes to tell a story about what that code does. So the the package of saying if you're a company, you know, com.comcast. You know, Xfinity. Uh, you know, feature. Camera. Camera fag fragment. You know, and you can kind of see how that leads up to a um, a uh, all the code that belongs to just that feature. And what that gives you is when you uh, when the time comes, you can pluck that package out and put it in its own library or its own module and, um, and not require a bunch of investigation and, uh, and major surgery inside your main code base. Um, and so as you might not need to follow this pattern you know, out, out of the gate with a smaller app, but if, as your app grows, um, by doing things this way, I really strongly believe you're going to um, uh, have a much easier time uh, growing to it. Like there, there is no limit to how large your app can get and how much you can scale. Um, and that's really what I leave you with today. So that was super fun to talk about. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions or uh, it's five o'clock here. So, uh, you know, feel free to uh, start your happy hours. Okay, well, I don't see any questions. Um, I will be very happy to stay on as long as there are people in the room and um, feel free to uh, moderator, feel free to unmute people if they just wanna talk, we have 15 more minutes. And, um, the, uh, and also I'll be available on chat uh, and, and I'll be online all day tomorrow. Yep, hey Benjamin, uh, good talk.
yeah, uh, folks, if you have any questions, please uh, use the chat to ask those questions. And if not, I believe there's a Slack channel, you can always reach out to Benjamin in regards to that. Yeah, we can keep this line open for however long it needs. Um, I know there's another session starting soon. There's a question from Sam Edwards. How do you handle UI and unit tests and the pipeline? Great question. Um, so along, the, along those lines, we have um, a, uh, a lot of layers of unit testing and, and, and the, the first layer, you know, just, just writing, we, we use um, Espresso and, and Mojito and, and, we, and, and Dagger Mock to, um, to run our, our rudimentary unit tests, uh, J unit tests and things like that. Um, those are all part of our, um, of our build, <laughs> thank you, sweetie. Um, our, that is part of our, uh, of our build pipeline that goes into all of our libraries and our, and our, and the main Xfinity, the main, the main Xfinity apps. Um, there's a much longer, like full regression. So this would be like unit tests that run against our pull requests, um, which we kind of want to get them verified and code reviewed and merged, uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Another layer of, um, using, um, uh, when there are espresso tests and, and UI automation tests that run uh, on a device farm and um, flush out any 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 bugs in the UI um, uh, that run uh, every time there's a, a merge to our main branch um, and verifies the that the the app the app's uh, functioning well and then several other levels of regression that go into that. Um, what challenges did you face testing different apps? Um, well, you know, I, I, if you, what you mean is I, I, the apps in my portfolio, I've, I've worked on, a, on, on uh, Horizon TV out in, out in, in, in Europe, uh, their, their cable app, and, and you seem to see some of my code in, in the QVC app and things like that, and especially Affinity Home. Um, the, you know, the, the one, one of the biggest challenges I think is, is uh, UI, is UI testing. Um, and trying to get unit unit testing unit tests that are valuable, and not just ones that need to be changed whenever you change something. So I, you know, I find that there's a lot of unit tests get written that just maybe verify that a button has the right text in it, and um, you know I don't find a lot of value in those tests. And I think that that it's hard to manage um, uh, making sure you're writing tests that have a lot of value and will catch bugs and give you high code coverage, and not a test that you're just going to need to rewrite. Um, when you like, when I change the text in that button, all I have to do is back, go back and change the text of that that test. So I look at what it's looking for, and there's not a lot of value in that. Um, we have extremely high level of code coverage. Uh, we use Sonar Cube, um, and it's one one thing that's really challenging for us is when you are trying to get some feature work in, and we have our threshold of saying um, never let we never let a pull request drop our code coverage below like 90 percent, and so. Um, you know, you have to write unit tests to get uh, your, your code merged. And if your code, your, your, your pull request won't verify if you drop our code coverage. And uh, that can make it really, really hard. Um, unless you, uh, like some, some people I know who are on this call, uh, love writing unit tests. Um, and that's up to the developer. Just to verify Sweetie, uh, Sweetie's question, uh, I, of course I'm awesome, right? <laughs> There's another um, question from Joseph. Did you face any challenges as folks may have moved to home office due to COVID? Oh, great question. Um, you know, uh, so there's the, 
we had a special situation at Comcast because if you're, if anybody's not from Philadelphia um, and you know, by all means, Google the tallest building in Philadelphia. We, we just, we just built a brand new headquarters in center city, Philadelphia. It's the tallest building in Philly. It's called the Comcast technology center. Uh, it's really cool. It's super modern. Uh, it has some, uh, we have a cafeteria that has, uh, uh, it's three stories high and it's got an arboretum with, with all the, a bunch of herbs that, uh, uh, you know, that, that the, the chefs use every day to pick out of the windows and, and make, make awesome meals for in our cafeteria. Um, so we all, we all like really were excited to move into the CTC and, uh, we all had to go home and, uh, you know, personally, my, I know my desk plant died. So I'm, I, that really, really upsets me. I was taking really care of it, but, um, I, me personally, you know, uh, Comcast is, is very good at supporting telecommuting and working from home. Um, so we, we always had a very flexible work from home policy in our organization and, um, it was very geared up to work from home. I'm actually, I feel like I'm highly productive out of my home office. I have a, uh, uh, you know, what amounts to a supercomputer sitting next to me and, um, that I code on every day. And, um, you know, going back to the office and working on my desk computer was a little slower. So, um, so, you know, a lot of us, uh, because we working from home came kind of naturally to a lot of us, we, um, uh, we were actually able to work. I, I'm personally able to work a lot more productively uh, out of my home office, uh, not having to take that one hour uh, train ride into the city uh, every day. Um, so other people have different challenges. We've uh, been doing a lot for each other as a team to um, keep our spirits up. So we have these, uh, I'm sure a lot of you used to, we have our, our online happy hours and we have trivia nights and, um, and other things to kind of keep us all, uh, all connected. But great question, thanks for asking. It's been a lot of fun for me as I, I work on an Ubuntu workstation and I love developing on, on Linux. And, um, and that's one of the special things about my home computer is I have it so for bringing an Android developer, I have so many uh, scripts and tools and things. And one, one thing I like to do is, um, you know, never type the same command line twice. And I always, uh, I always uh, am doing my builds or running my tests or, or, check, or checking out from Git. Uh, every time I do something, the same commands uh, more than a few times in a row, I write a script for it. And, uh, you know, I, at this point, working from home so much, my, uh, I, my, I have so many, I have so many productivity tools that I put onto my, my, my machine um, that just make the development so much faster and easier. <laughs> did, you, did you face any challenges as folks have moved to home office due to COVID-19? And how many apps do you handle intermittent network connection? And what is the built what is built into your standard pattern connections to uh, to Comcast ser server side? Um, let me try to understand the question. Um, so our apps, we build apps that are designed to be offline sometimes. So an intermittent network connections. Now I have especially Xfinity Home, um, where when I was working from the, from when I was working on downtown Philly, I would um, take the train home every night. And I would use the Xfinity Home app, and, and what would happen there was, we would, as the train is shooting from Philadelphia down the main line out to where I live, um, where I'm constantly dropping and transitioning networks. So I'll pass a train station that has an Xfinity hotspot. My phone will jump to that, then drop, then get a 3G network, and then a 4G, and then drop again. And it was really important to me that was my way of testing the app to, to handle intermittent network connections. Um, the uh, and so it's good for us to be able to test our apps in this kind of environment um, where we're all on our home networks um, and almost more of a realistic and realistic environment for using a home security app. Um, I can tell you at, at CTC, we have, we, we've always called it very Wi-Fi polluted. We have had uh, hundreds and hundreds of Wi-Fi connections because our home security systems uh, need, a, need a Wi-Fi connection to work. So we have, they're scattered all over the floor there. Um, but, uh, 
And as far as, um, so our, our, our apps are have kind of this like offline first um, uh, mentality that uh, we assume the network's gonna drop um, and, and reconnect and, and resume and try to do as many smoke and mirrors for the user so they, when you, um, when you arm your home security system um, and we start the countdown and we wanna make absolutely sure that that's working um, and we drop a connection um, and you know, we might, we might not know, we might've missed um, uh, some of that, that arming system countdown. Um, and you know, the, the, the fallbacks we have to, to double check, re-request the status, um, especially with, with the MQTT stuff that, that, that Sweetie talked about. Um, there's that quality of service where if we missed, uh, we expect it to get a message back from a bro the broker and we, and we missed it. To, uh, to double check and get the status of, of that device. Um, so that's all really interesting. That's you know, really, really a big part of what we do is keeping the app going while you know, it's a mobile app. It's meant, it's meant to be um, moving from place to place and changing networks and losing network and regaining it uh, while users are using it. I hope that, that answered your question. <laughs> that, uh, absolutely, for me personally, absolutely. Um, there's that dream of Kotlin. Uh, we we are all in on Kotlin at, at, and for Android, and um, you know we we had some. There's always been that dream of building once and deploying twice. You know, to like doing like web based or React or something that can that can uh, build build an app and 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 run it in a web view and. Uh, we've had little spatterings of that, and we've we've pushed back really hard from it as the engineers say we want to be fully native, um, and uh, we we do that. So now, Kotlin multi-platform has this great other side of the the mirror to say, um, uh, can we build what can, can we build some root components that um, can be used on iOS and Android? Because we we have an, a, a corresponding iOS team, and they're doing everything in Swift, and um, you know that wouldn't it be great if we could if we could take maybe our network layer and replace it with a with with one Kotlin multi-platform. So that uh, that would be a hard sell. Uh, it's a big big architecture change, but uh, so for my personal, yeah, I've absolutely considered it, and I'm learning Kotlin multi-platform on on my own, writing some Ubuntu apps. Um, so we're we're not we you know it's it's hard to talk about Flutter and and other programming languages really need to consider that we have 50 engineers, you know, doing, contributing to an Android app. And um, where, where's the excitement? Where, what do they want to do? And what, what kind of talent do we want to attract? Um, like, are you looking, are, are people out there looking for jobs doing Flutter? Or are, are the rock stars out there that we want to, that we want to attract? Do they want to, do they want to do Kotlin multi-platform or Kotlin in general? Um, and uh, and what kind of staffing do we have? So we've had a lot of web uh, like web view based parts of our app um, because we have a really strong team of web developers. So uh, you know that has to guide that management thinking of what what type of tools what what what's up, what is our app going to look like? What's our code going to look like? Um, you know nobody you know, maybe one or two people in our team knew Flutter. Um, so we've had these conversations where we said what what's the next version of the Affinity app going to be like and how's it going to run? And you know, I'm, I'm sure I was muttering, you know, well, we should try and call it multi-platform because it's super cool, super new. But I, I would, I would, I, I absolutely would love to see that one day. Um, but we did have to decide and make some kind of tough decisions and say, hey, we have some people here who love Flutter. We have some people here who love web web view development, doing the thing web based, and um, and we have to cross train them and tell them, you know, we we need you to learn Kotlin and be a Kotlin developer. Um, and so that was, th those are those tough decisions you have to make when you're choosing an architecture. Great questions, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben, for answering those questions. Um, we can still keep it the line open if you want uh, for another few minutes. Sure. 
and to see if you have any more questions. Carlos says, thank you for your answers and presentation. No, it's my, my pleasure, guys. I'm really enjoying the conference. I hope to meet you all in person in, on, at better times. <laughs> Android 2021. Absolutely. We, did, uh, we had an interesting uh, experience with COVID when, um, when everything went down. Uh, the, the mobile teams all rallied to get help for, you know, uh, in our apps, um, there was a, a lot of um, uh, things that Comcast did for um, you know getting internet access to people uh, who didn't have it or uh, questions about COVID and you're, you're you know needing to get stay on the internet um, with all the, the, the tragic things that are happening and we we pushed out a lot of uh, updates to our app to um, uh, uh, with with COVID, COVID help uh, in in the X5 and, and X Home apps and uh, it was. Uh, uh, it you know gave us all a lot of pride to be able to uh, to help in some way. Cool. Oh, question: um, How do you focus on UI across multiple languages to deliver to customers? What is built into your process, and what do you what do individual apps need to do? Um, so, you know, we we have. The Comcast, as general, has about ten different different apps out out in the stores, um, and we try to write UI using our, our latest pattern. So if we're building something new, so we don't we we right now today we are um, uh, writing things twice. You know, we write Swift Swift UI using Swift. We use UI using uh, Android tools, and the um, uh, so but these. Processes so other other apps that use different languages um, maybe there are a lot of Java apps out there and things like that um, have completely different build processes um, and the uh, uh, oh oh <laughs> okay thank you um, yeah that's interesting we we are, have developers all across the uh, the country uh, and all across the world and um, the uh, you know we usually love that when we ha we do have syndicated partners who use our app in Italy and we have some Italian developers and, and it's so great to have multilingual people on the teams uh, who can who can manage manage that. Um, the uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm just, it's kind of that's kind of like out of my out of my area of expertise I suppose um, but uh, we do um, uh, I'm sure we, we use uh, Slack and, and all, all of our communication we're using you know, on Slack and Teams. And, um, you know, if there was a, uh, uh, you know, we're, I think we all just know each other. My colleagues and I, we all work together so well. Uh, we know, um, uh, uh, oh, um, I'm sorry, you mean the customer, I thought you meant the developers speak, how <laughs> developers speak different languages, I'm sure they do. Um, so we, yeah, we have an entire, pro, uh, you know, content management system for managing the different languages. Our, our X5 app only supports uh, Spanish and English. Um, so we have, you know, the basic two, two build files there with two strings, XMLs. And um, the, uh, you know, we also have to uh, have a, a build that goes out and use in, in uh, uh, France and uh, has a French language support and another in Italy using as English, Italian language support. And um, we generally will get UX. Uh, we have like UX experts uh, who give us our, our design specs and our text copy. Um, and we, they can actually go into our CMS system and make changes to, uh, like if we've gotten the grammar wrong on some, uh, some language uh, translation, can go into our CMS system and, and, and edit our strings there. And then our build process will pull in the latest version of the strings and, um, and, and add those to the native app. And if we have a, um, uh, again, if somebody gets a, an idea of a string wrong, you know, then the linter picks that up and the bill breaks. But yeah, it's a, a huge challenge. Uh, uh, biggest challenge I had with that was was in uh, when I was working on the Horizon TV app out in, in which are headquartered out in Amsterdam for Horizon TV, and they supported the German language, which is fascinating. And German has some really strong, long words, 
and um, uh, the translations and, and getting those uh, unexpected uh, text fields to fit properly uh, was always a, a really interesting challenge we had. Um, and the other end of that is also if uh, any, any language comes from your uh, from an API and having localization there. So if, um, not really a problem with our app, but on the XY app, but with the um, things like our stream app, where you're, you're seeing a uh, your TV guide and all your channels available and what, and what you want to stream and watch. And a lot of those lo are localized um, to uh, give the right language, but uh, on a dynamic uh, standpoint from uh, API calls and download downloading content, as opposed to um, you know, your strings XML file. I hope that that answered your question. Localization is the, uh, I would say it's hard in Android, but it's the life we chose. <laughs> So accessibility is another one of those challenges. Comcast has an entire department dedicated to accessibility. Um, we have people who work for us that, are, that have um, uh, disabilities and are on those teams. And you know they're amazing to work with. Um, this one gentleman I work with all the time who's uh, completely blind. Um, and he will use our app and the accessibility features in our app like light speed, he's super fast at it. And he'll show us how to, and we try as developers, uh, you know, he, he tells us like, close, try using your app and close your eyes. Um, but uh, we, ha we have what we call, uh, what are called accessibility audits, um, where we actually ship our apps off to third parties who will tell us, um, you know, he, first off, if, if an accessibility feature is not working, like a talk back's not saying the right thing or doing the right thing, but then also what goes in like fundamentally into our designs um, that make sure, uh, you know, uh, hearing impaired, visually impaired, physically impaired people can use our, our products. Um, it, is, it is absolutely in the center of, of Comcast. Uh, we have an entire accessibility lab um, where all of our products get tested um, and uh, really cool place to, to go into. It's essentially like a giant deck, like living room with every, every product we have uh, that are constantly being tested. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's, a very uh, 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 important topic to us because we have a huge customer base of, of, of people with needs like that. And um, uh, I don't really have any, there, we, when we actually just had a meeting about this the other day, there aren't any really good tools today to like audit, automate accessibility testing. Um, and that would be a really cool thing to, to work on one day. Again, thank you, Ben, for answering those questions. We appreciate it. Um, great talk. And I believe you're on that Slack channel. And if anybody needs uh, any other questions to be answered, you can always reach out to Ben over there. Absolutely. Again, thank you. It was a great presentation. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.